I have been waiting to do this video for years. I am Couch Coop. This is a comprehensive look at the three Dawn of War games. I'm just flexing my Steam account here. Kind of obsessed with Warhammer RTS and turn base. Loved a bit of that Gladius, and I'm currently trying to enjoy Demon Hunters. I do need to warn you, there is gonna be a little bit of this. We might as well just blow up the planet then, because if they're in control, it's pure Satanism. Talking of godlike, our first port of call is the original Dawn of War. I got that Game of the Year edition and sort of the incremental Winter Assault various add-ons, but then we have the Dark Crusade. This intro is etched in my gaming memory. They are in a sort of strange order as well because I do still play one of these three games frequently, still on my hard drive, still go to it as a cool RTS experience. And it was an acquired taste, it wasn't something that immediately ran up to me as a great sequel to one of the most awesome Warhammer 40k RTS games available on the market, Dawn of War 1. One of the most amazing things about that disc was the sheer size of maps that you had choice from and the addition of the Necron and of course, the Tau. These guys are on stuff that like nobody even knows. What do you think they're on? Stuff they've been given. Okay. I have also stripped all mods. None of these games are going to have any modifications on them at all. I just think it's more fair to go at base game on all of them. Now, this came out in 2004. Having the choice of seven different Warhammer races was a complete mind blower for the time and RTS. What is your will? It also came with some pretty cool tricks up its sleeve. The idea of mod your capsule and sort of taking a map over bit by bit as opposed to complete base annihilation was sort of new and being kicked around still. Having the map broken down into sort of fragmented battle areas where you'd go through sort of some miniature skirmishes just to take over a point as opposed to that big 1v1 in the middle of the map that ends the game. It really broke things up and gave RTS a very new taste for me. Its production also was top level. Relic took the subject matter very seriously. All of the voice acting, most of it completely iconic and still around today that the Marines used and the Servitors, even right down to the Orgs. Brilliant voice sampling. I think even Sean Pertwee might be doing the voice of the Chaplain. If it isn't him, it's damn close. Yes, my lord. Also featured, you don't see it much in the other two games, elevation, stat buffs, different terrain. You were really at a disadvantage if you got caught in a trough, maybe in water. There was almost valley-like map setups where you could get height and cause massive increased damage on an enemy that was in a vulnerable spot. Teams also broke, morale went down, and they just became useless. Having a squad template as opposed to individual little players or models was very awesome because you could give everyone an individual weapon. If there was a buff going out, they were all affected by it. It was a new idea for me and wasn't something you saw in the StarCraft games. The Necron were not underdone also. They're very popular now in a lot of Warhammer video games, but back then this was their first real visceral fruition. AI is alien. Like a, like a robot? Yeah, they're like robots coming to kill you. Jesus Christ. Because I've played so much of its two sequels, I sort of approached Dawn of War 1 in current day with a bit of snobbery, but it kicked my ass. I completely forgot how important those decisions are early on if you want to go with a captain or even the development trees that you need to go down. We're going to touch on that now. The area of the game that sort of reflects onto a lot of hero MOBAs. Some of your key characters, every race had like an important individual. They would have cool moves that could be developed and opened up and then more importantly could be attached to a squad, particularly in the marine section of the game. It was a very cool idea. That aspect stayed on right the way through the entire series. And if you know all three games well, you know what that came to. I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! Another aspect that disappeared for the final of the three games is the ability to be able to move that camera. It is not a locked isometric. You can zoom in and out on Dawn of War 3, but everything feels completely battened down without being able to swing it all round and get a good look at this awesome battle game, even some good 
fade and distance mechanics on this game. Not a bad looking RTS for something that's 20 years old and it still plays impeccably. All comes flooding back once you start hearing those voice samples again. When the trailer or intro is better than the game, what an awful thing to happen. I was so hyped for this when they were announcing it. Relic still at the helm, and this was our first bit of teaser footage. Everyone lost their minds. Titans were in it. They were up in the size of everything. Jesus, how this went wrong. I think a couple of things happened here. Do you remember me referring to that hero mechanic and them having available moves, hotkeys almost, and it feeling a bit MOBA-like? Well, this went full pelt towards that direction, giving an almost key character to each race. Everything sort of had to revolve around them. If you lose them, it's a major blow. It was also locked isometric, which felt so strange. These character models are some of the best in gaming. The detail on them and the way that the orcs are shown off along with the Eldar. Here is the second kick in the proverbials. Only three races. If you're aware of the second dawn of war, you know there's a couple of races in there that are amazing fun to play. They are not here. Well, I took this fall after I did all the work. And you deserve to work. We wouldn't be in this mess if it weren't for your plans. It very much wants you to look at its campaign, which reminds me I didn't show any off of the campaign in Dawn of War 1, that really cool galactic map screen where you're taking over the planet. Apologies. The area that I look at on RTS like this is the skirmish mode. Why is that? Because it gives you a brilliant vertical slice. Of all the research trees, nothing's held back. It's not like you're at stage five and don't have access to X troops. You see everything in a race, so that's why I love delving deep into it. And also with long-term plan of the game. Stuff just wasn't working. Troops were not going where they asked them to because the maps are so concertinaed and you have to go the long way round and you're forced into playing race types, which was really mind-blowing. I've hardly ever played as the orc characters in any of the games. So this was an eye-opener. I would much rather have a solid race focus set of three campaigns on this game. But that still doesn't detract from how much tech this game's using for an RTS and also how pretty it still is. It's quite a thirsty one on the old CPU, but Jesus, when it kicks out, it kicks out. This is useful only if it wins us this battle. As well as removing quite a lot of the game format from its previous game, they also put back in some of the Dawn of War 1 aspects, including that base building element, which really threw me back because a lot of RTS, modern ones particularly of this year, sort of streamlined that idea. Again, we're back to capturing the point, dominating that map. And this one also came with really key relic points that could be like a huge gun that could switch around the whole battle. Get this. When it first came out, it didn't have a mode which allowed you to just go after each other's bases as well as having that map superiority. Now it does, it's pretty cool. You have a reason to put turrets down and also where to put your buildings, vulnerable stuff at the back, that sort of thing. They also removed that difference in terrain buff or nerf depending on if you're on a peak or in a dip. There's none of that there really. There's no real cover areas either. You don't see them huddle behind anything. So that one was a big blow. The combat massively simplified. But talking of simple, let's talk about the elites. They are these ridiculously overpowered superhero models that you can bring in. You can see them over there on the left and you can switch those out depending on what loadout you prefer. There's quite a lot of choice 
on these and it's really the direction the whole game goes in as opposed to it being a real-time strategy game and I think that's definitely what put me and a lot of the fans off. We've also sort of lost that individual unit management with getting them new guns, upgrading them. Yeah, you can put flamethrowers in, give them a few las cannons, but they feel very sterile compared to what we had in Dawn of War 1 and its predecessor game. I will hand it to Relic though, they do the orcs right in this game, making them loud, destructive, huge platoon sized groups, loads of machinery and rust, and that awesome voiceover. It does go crazy off the hook, and playing this in 2024 it does make me remember a little bit how awesome RTS's went when there were full cylinder firing. Removing that sort of coupling mechanic to the captains and the squads does also take away a bit from you. But we do have individual squads leveling the more damage they do. That's something that the previous game got very right and also having a nice high ranked pristine set of tactical marines ready to go is kind of a pleasure. The orbital is funny, this is a hell this goes for hell divers. And my existence, while grotesque and incomprehensible to you, saves lives. Andre, he like to be trying to get into his opponent's heads by saying crazy stuff. He ain't gonna get into my head. I follow thee. Along with the Orcs, the Eldar are also extremely well shown off. They are given so much respect in that intro with the Banshees and that haunting female voice. Some of the main characters or hero characters that of that race look excellent in this. Their powers, the electricity, a lot of their vehicles, it does shine through. But it's just unfortunate that this meta RTS is really lackluster and very much hero focused. <laughs> A lot of the explosions do actually chug at my PC still. I'm not too sure if that's the game's fault or my GTX 1660, but this is what, 2018? So I'm surprised at that. Also, Dawn of War 1 defaulted me to medium settings. A 2004 game. I had to go in and just like move the sliders up. I was thinking, that's, that's not a funny joke. Okay, I think that's enough wallowing in the crapness of Dawn of War 3. Let's get on with what this video is really about. Before that. There is, however, one small problem. That everyone always gets slaughtered in the first 10 seconds. <laughs> That's right! Dawn of War 2 gave us Tyranid and the Imperial Guard, complete with Lehman Rust tanks and Hive Tyrants. It was absolutely awesome to clap eyes on first time round, but remember we are back to the sequel to Dawn of War 1. So loads of this stuff was really shocking, not as disturbing as what we saw in Dawn of War 3, and in hindsight, and over the last five years, this game has really shone as an excellent RTS full stop, let alone being a real-time strategy game. Look at the different faction colors and the differences in Heroes. So we are leaning towards that aspect of the game, but it's expertly balanced with Dawn of War 2, taking a pinch from 3 and loads from 1, amalgamating it into its own thing. It's quite an incredible RTS. The Chimeras are alien, and there's a hive, hive mind sort of thinking to a lot of this. Let's just go over quickly what it does have. So it has got a 360 degree camera change angle. And with these visuals and those model details, even the structures, everything looks incredible. You've got a full zoom in and out. We also have a really healthy cover mechanic, giving you a yellow symbol. If you put your soldiers near any furniture or obstacles, it will increase your stats on cover. That's really important. Don't see too much elevation change, but it does increase some of the range weaponry. 
We do have our traditional captain or commander or person of importance on each race bag. They're not crazy overpowered elite characters that are pulled in at any given time. And these guys can also be incrementally upgraded and looked after and given one of three different variables. So there's three different choices of hero and then three different sub variants of combination of buff or perk that you're going to put on them. It's really deep, incredible stuff but you can't latch them onto a unit. Why did they take that away? They have kept that point capture system in, but disabled the point to have any ordnance or gun on it. We did see that come back in Dawn of War 3, but it sort of works. You don't have to worry about building really anything other than generators. This goes for the base also expansion. Everything is just done automatically. This really allows you to focus on individual battles in and around this huge map and you can up it to I think four on four. The Tyranids are done so well with like Ripper Killers and Hive stuff coming up through the map everywhere and the Hive Tyrant is genuinely terrifying. They're eating her! And then they're going to eat me! Oh my god! Our fortifications are under This game also did a bit of a Dawn of War 1 with its expansion or DLCs, sort of incrementally giving us little bits, just like the Chaos Rising, but the Retribution, that's where it's at. The whole thing is on that singular purchase, and it's really got that slight twist on the graphics. I think they gave it as recent a boost as they could, but it still looks great. Swinging that camera around, being able to watch the replays and listen to all this great sound and voice sampling. has also got not a bad campaign that's marine focused bit of story bit of structure you get introduced to a lot of the tyrant hero characters as adversaries as well as a few cutscenes it isn't skimped on but the skirmish mode is incredible i'm going to show you a little hint to getting more out of it in a second but i just am so addicted to it i play it like a sort of roguelike run always got that expert difficulty you can have medium to hard that's important you only have three slots on Dawn of War 3. I'm pretty sure you can still play this game co-op against AI online. They're still cast in competitive matches on full PvP. It is still a thing and you still have a player count running on it, which is testament to how well this game actually is doing now. It got so completely ripped to shreds by hardcore Dawn of One fans when it first came out, but I know for a fact if we knew how terrible Dawn of War 3 was and that was going to be the last we'd ever see from Relic's Warhammer 40k RTS series. We would have grabbed this with more hands. So this is my current trick with the game at the moment. I'm playing offline and solo. What I do is I get an NPC to play with me on a two player front and I can pitch how good they are. Put them on normal and always make them the Imperial Guard. Then you can pair up two on the enemy side and choose the hero characters. And I like to sort of change that around a lot. I normally do double chaos, which is amazing. Or just go full Tyranid, Eldar as well, everything has its own sort of level of entry and so you can learn and swing those variables maybe make the imperial guard not the sharpest tool in the shed we got this one kid mongo he's got a forehead like a drive-in movie theater but he's a good shit an easy npc character to put more pressure on yourself or even put the two you're fighting up on expert and you can increase this ratio 1v1 on this game is great but being part of like a larger massive war is completely awesome but surely that's I don't know, pissing in the wind. It gives the Chaos player and the Tyranid characters some really awesome vehicle equivalents, including some mounted Chaos Beasts that you saw there, and a Carnifex makes an appearance. You really do feel like you're playing a very high-end Exterminatus simulator. Don't even get me started on those death animations. It's really industry leading stuff. And back when this came out, I feel so bad for that team getting the pushback that they did. If you go through this again, 
with your sort of RTS connoisseur's hat on, I guarantee you'll be very surprised. It's still relevant today quality. Elves is the main group. Okay. And they call them the elves. It's clockwork elves. I don't think you're allowed to say that anymore. Ready was of course Couch Coop and thank you very much for coming on that journey with me. Other Warhammer games, 40k that I enjoy, that Space Hulk, Tactics is okay, and Mechanicus, and of course the aforementioned Gladius, all of which have been put into a full video. I will put the link in the description. Ah, ah, ah.